Well, hello, everyone. Um, we see a lot of familiar faces. I see Pia waving. Thank you, Pia. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Patty Robinson, uh, Faculty Director of Civic and Community Engagement at College of the Canyons. And I'm joined by um, Kimberly Rosenfeld from um, Cerritos College. We are so happy to be here. Um, this is our last deep dive and our last uh, meeting actually for the, excuse me, for the semester. Um, as you all know, we've had seven dialogues this semester along with our two deep dives. Last week, it was Chris Wobey um, who talked about project-based learning. And today we're honored to have Don Whitehead uh, re return uh, to our, um, our group and discuss um, integrative learning and global learning today. So we are just so thrilled to have her here. And again, I see a lot of familiar faces and I know that there are some of you who are joining us for the first time. So welcome to everyone. Also, just to let you know, uh, Kimberly and Jan Connell and I are already looking at our spring semester. So uh, we hope to have a series lined up for spring and you'll be hearing about that probably right after the first of the year. And again, mm -hmm. a big thank you to um, pre-CSN and Keelan and Rebecca for all the help that they've given us uh, this semester. So with that, I wanna turn it over um, and introduce Don uh, Michelle Whitehead. Uh, Don is the Vice President of the Office of Global Citizenship for Campus Community and Careers at the Association of American Colleges and Universities or AACNU. Her work focuses on advancing practices and strategies to integrate global and experiential learning across curricular and co-curricular initiatives, general education and the majors within professional schools and on campus and off campus experiences. She also works closely with institutions to embed high impact practices in integrative learning with an emphasis on quality and equitable participation. Dr. Whitehead has presented nationally and internationally on global learning, civic engagement, community-based global learning, curricular change, experiential learning, global health, liberal education, integrative learning, and strategic planning. She has also written articles on the topics and on these topics and facilitated grant funded projects to advance student success through curricular change. She is also the director of AAC News Institute on Integrative Learning and Signature Work. Prior to her work at AACNU, Dr. Whitehead served as the Director for Curriculum Internalization as a Faculty Director for Global Service Learning uh, uh, programs in Costa Rica, Ghana, Kenya, and the Kingdom of Swaziland and taught Global and International Studies courses at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Dr. Whitehead earned her PhD at Indiana University Bloomington in Education Policy Studies with a doctoral minor in International and Comparative Education and a concentration in African Studies. And I know that Dawn is a huge basketball fan and I know that she talked a little bit about this last time. So any of you who are Lakers fans, um, you got Dawn here to, 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 to help uh, promote uh, basketball. <laughs> so with that, I'm turning it over to uh, Dr. Don Michelle Whitehead. We're honored to have you here. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. I, um, I'm very happy to be with you again. And I'll, I'll recap a couple of things that we talked about last time, as well as introduce some new concepts and some new concepts and some new ideas. Um, and so I can go very quickly through this slide. Sometimes I'm not sure what's going to be said about me. So I like to add a little bit um, the other dimension, all of that information was shared before. Um, one other thing I'll add, and Patty knows my love of basketball, and I also love tennis, so you'll see tennis and basketball throughout. And this was uh, Serena Williams, arguably the greatest woman tennis player of all time. Uh, the thing that I really like about Serena is that she embodies what we want for global learners. Um, she is someone who speaks multiple languages. She has invested her time, talent, and her resources around the world in different projects to empower uh, youth in particular. Um, and she does many of the things that we want our students to do when we say we want them to exhibit global learning skills. So I always, if I don't talk about Arthur Ashe <laughs> or Bill Russell, I do like to talk about Serena. So that's just a little bit about me as well. Um, what, what I want to look at today and what I'd like to focus on during our time together is looking at the context of what's happening right now in the world and why 
it means global learning is more important than perhaps it has ever been, some might argue. I wanna go over what global learning is and what that means for your courses, for your programs, for your experiences. I wanna look specifically at the global learning and the civic engagement rubrics and how that might impact some of your work. And then I wanna end with a conversation and discussion about the power of high impact practices. Um, so to start, um, you know, I think obviously we know that higher education is changing greatly, was changing before the pandemic. Um, higher education was and is becoming more diverse, more expansive. We're having contested conversations about our value. We have to make a strong case for it. We've been thrust into this remote learning. And so there are a lot of things swirling around and many people are using this as a time to reimagine higher education. Um, one thing that we do know is our student population is changing and, 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 and this is something that we're seeing students from more diverse backgrounds are coming in economically as well as different um, cultural and ethnic groups and racial groups. Um, and we're seeing that that is changing the, the, the population and, and the number of students who are in higher education. This is a review from last time. We looked at what some of the top seven critical threats were according to the Chicago Council. And you know we talked about COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, violent extremism on the home front, development of China as a world power, the downturn in the economic environment, political polarization in the US, international terrorism, and I think it's important to look at these dimensions and we can look at them in terms of polarization and what independents, Democrats, Republicans think. But I think it's also good to look at them and think about which of these have a global dimension and how we can help make that clear to our students that this is actually a value for them when we're doing this work. Another thing is which of these have a civic dimension and how we can look at what the threats and what, what is going on in the world definitely impacts the civic space as well as the global space in which our students are working. Um, another thing I like to add, and it, it's, I think it's important to look at, again, we talked about this a little bit last time, that the problems that are the grand challenges as some have named them, like the global health crisis, climate change, they are too large for a single country to handle alone. And in the same survey, many Americans agreed with that. And 84% of those surveyed in the Chicago Council survey agreed that international cooperation was the only way to serve such, to solve such large challenges. One respondent said, isolationism doesn't work. Countries need to work together. And I think that is a challenge for us in higher education to make sure that our students are prepared to engage with the world. Pew also had a survey that came out. This was from earlier this year in March. So this was, in, they, they collected the data in the midst of the, the pandemic starts the early stages, and you see again, it said 86% of Americans said it was important to cooperate with other countries in regard to the spread of infectious diseases, as well as other categories that you can see from this lens. So I think it's just important to situate what we're doing in our climate. The last thing that was also interesting, and this is also fairly recent data out of Pew from September, is that many people, they, they did a survey asking what progress the US was making in terms of racial, racial equality. And it was interesting when they said the country may not, those that said the country hadn't gone far enough, but they said it would require a lot to reduce inequality. And they thought these were some of the areas where there could be change. More people participating in diversity training, uh, redrawing school district boundaries to have more racially and ethnic diverse schools, limiting the scope of policing to focus on violent crimes. And you can see the other dimensions that impact all of us. Now, the other thing that I think is important when we think about context is that we are doing this work in a time when there is a global call for racial justice. And it's not something that just imp impacted our communities. Um, I'm, I'm based in Washington, DC. Again, I, I always share I'm a Hoosier. I'm from Indianapolis and I have family there. Um, and we saw after the killing of George Floyd, we saw uprisings, we saw protests, we saw movements all around the world. And if we are preparing our students, they need to be aware that situations that they may think are situated in the US context are actually of importance all around the world. So I just wanted to share a few images. The first is from Portugal, the middle is from South Korea, the final two, one is from Manchester in, in, in the UK, and then in Scotland. So you can see that in these different spaces, people were making the same cries for, for racial justice. Another example you can see in South Africa, there's some protest images in Madrid where they're actually calling George Floyd's name in Sweden and Argentina. And then there was also a call for some reckoning for what was happening in those countries. So in Paris, there were, there were calls for individuals who had been killed 
in strange circumstances as well. So the, the movement was not just a US-based movement and our students have to be aware of these issues. The second thing in this one, everybody knows this as well. One of the, the things that, that we need in terms of this ad, uh, addressing this, this, this global pandemic is global cooperation. And we're seeing that happen. Of course, we, many of us were excited. Some were, you know, some are, are, are reserving their excitement in terms of the, the vaccine that was developed by, by Pfizer. Others are saying we need to learn from each other, how people are stopping the spread, learn from each other, how you can change the way you're doing business. We're doing that in higher education. But again, it just shows the importance of global learning in this context as well. And finally, I just wanna share a few quick figures and facts on what employers have been telling us. So at AACNU, every few years we do an employer survey and I pulled data from the different surveys to share and we'll have another employer survey that's coming out in January and I'll be sure to share that with Patty and she can get that information out to you if you don't join us at our annual meeting. One thing is that we found that employers are increasingly globally connected and they're placing a higher emphasis on students with this global knowledge. So that could be having operations outside the US, suppliers outside the US or clients outside the US. So even if your students are not planning to travel, they still need to be prepared to do this work. Employers also told us that students were not prepared on these outcomes. One, knowledge of global developments. Two, knowledge of cultures and societies outside the US. Three, world language proficiency. Four, problem solving in diverse groups. And then five, in scientific literacy. Another thing, and many of you know this, depending on which field you're in, it's not just employers, but it's also our accreditors that want us to have students who are prepared to engage and to know about the world. Social work, they want students who are prepared to engage diversity and difference in practice. So they want them to think about the intersectionality of class, color, culture, ethnicity, gender, et cetera. Nursing, they want students who are prepared to practice in culturally and ethnically diverse global society, as well as having experiences from different perspectives. Engineering, of course, the emphasis is on being able to work in those multidisciplinary teams and having a broad impact to understand the global and economic context in which you're working. And finally, in business, we're finding this importance of inclusive inclusion and diversity and global perspectives in careers. So I want to give us a couple of minutes and we can do this together and just think about what are the ways that you are currently providing students with opportunities to demonstrate these skills that employers think are valuable. And there's a document um, that Patty will, or Patty, I think it will go out later. Or I don't know if it went out already. Okay, it'll go out later. So don't worry, you'll have all the, the content from these slides you'll get in the, the form of this handout. But I want you to just think, and, and we can you can come off mute if you want to and tell us, what is an activity or an assignment where you could have your students demonstrate that they have gained global knowledge, demonstrate that they're prepared to communicate with people outside the US, demonstrate that they have gained or practiced intercultural skills, solve problems with people whose views are different, as well as solve problems with in other types of diverse groups. So let's just take 30-ish seconds and think about, is there a particular activity or assignment that you're already doing that you could add a dimension so that students could demonstrate this skill? And then we'll have you come off mute or enter your responses in the chat. So we'll just take 30 seconds so you can think about it, then look at the chat. Oh, you haven't failed. Today is a new challenge. <laughs> no failure whistle. <laughs> so any, any ideas about how you might be able to add something in? Again, it, it doesn't have to be a signature work assignment like we talked about last time. It could just be something that you are able to add to what's already going on in your class. Okay, good, we've got one holding conversation circles, addressing social topics with students from other cultures, excellent. That's a great idea. 
another one, a lecture on the dimensions of cultural variability, and then ask students to deconstruct a case study where there was miscommunication based on cultural differences. Get them to unpack what happened and how it can be improved. Excellent. Some even do that in the, um, oh my gosh, I'm going to call it a donut, but that's not the proper name, the inside-outside circle. Maybe I'm hungry, no. <laughs> Um, but the inside outside circle where people can deconstruct in the middle and those outside then give their reactions. Okay, good. Adding discussion questions related to the topics. Excellent. That's very, very good. Okay, adding global communities to your research assignment. Exactly. You can have students do comparisons. Thank you for that, Kim, the fishbowl. <laughs> um, student presentations from their cultures. Excellent. So they have a way to share. Okay, Melissa, thank you. Some of your students are focusing on issues outside the US, very good. Making diverse employees when discussing management versus leadership, excellent. Talking about different leadership styles that may emerge. Okay, good, Caitlin. Um, identity, intersectionality, and positionality and understanding how multiple stories are important. Very good, you may have seen that TED talk uh, by Chimandi uh, Adichie where she talks about the power of a single story and how it's important to realize that that one story doesn't represent everyone. You have to look at other, th other factors. So I'll put that in the chat later if you wanna take a look at that. Um, let's see, getting students to discuss the religious practices for the season, how they developed, how they celebrate. Excellent, another great way to do it. Okay, great, I'm glad someone is using that, the power story. Research papers that require comparison, excellent. So those are all really, really good examples. And that and that TED talk is so quick. So I'm glad someone is using that. Okay, very good. Bringing in historical perspectives to math topics and contemporary international cooperation and math community research. I was just at a session with colleagues from a university in Puerto Rico, and they were talking about when they're talking, as you said again, about who's been doing research in math. Are there some who have done research who are Puerto Rican? And yes, indeed, there are many. Um, and by including their perspectives, even though Puerto Ricans are US citizens, so don't think I'm, <laughs> I'm not aware of that. Um, but they were talking about how to make, how to infuse better perspectives so students see themselves in their work. Okay, these are all very, very good. Okay, excellent. Any, any other questions or comments? Okay, and, and if you all can help me in case I miss somebody, um, if they wanted to come off mute, feel free. So I think now what I wanna do is push us deeply into global learning. And we did a little bit of this last time um, and so, you know, I asked you, I said, okay, what is global learning? But we have a, a couple of folks that are, are, are new to this group. So when you say global learning, does anybody want to say something aloud or you want to write in the chat what you think global learning is? I know last time we talked about, um, well, I don't want to say, I don't want to say anything to spoil it, <laughs> um, but you want to go ahead and put in the chat what you think global learning is. Okay, and thank you again, we see international films. And if you don't want to say what you think global learning is, can you put in the chat what global learners can do so we can think about it from a different perspective? Hello, this is Kendrick. Um, yes, what Kendrick, I think global thank you. Learning, what I think global learning is, I think global learning is learning aspects that is outside from your um, societal space, you know? Okay. So mm -hmm. if you're if you're from, California and all you know is California, but you learn from other cultures that are outside of that space of California. I would even Excellent. say that you would learn space from other states too, because when I visited um, DC and New York and Virginia area, um, mm -hmm. it was a different world to me because mm -hmm. the certain foods even, like for example, um, I love tapatio in my, um, in my food. And when I'm over there to have Mexican food, which I think is Mexican food, it's not. They they have they don't even know what tapatio is, and I thought mm -hmm. I was speaking a different language. So even among states, it's kind of that cultural diversity, that that globalness of it from different yes. states. I think that's what global is, in my opinion. I may be Excellent. wrong though. No, I think you're get. I think you're 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 spot on in terms of what the broader understanding is. Thank you for that. Any others? I I, I of course have a food illustration. So you know, I'm from Indiana. I'm Hoosier. But part of my family is from South Florida, so the Miami area. And so we grew up, um, you know, learning a lot about the cultures that were in Miami, Indiana at the time. There weren't a lot of folks who were Spanish was their first language. We didn't have a lot of Cuban folks um, when we were in Miami. We did. And so when you talk about the food example, Kendrick, it's funny because we'd have uh, Cuban food in Miami. <laughs> and then, you know, there was one, I think Cuban restaurant when I was like middle school and it was nothing. The Cuban food in Indiana was nothing <laughs> like the Cuban food 
that I had in Miami. And then in 2003, I had an, oppor I had an opportunity to go to Cuba and the food in Cuba was even different. So I think you're right. Sometimes those examples are different. Um, thank you, okay. thank and, you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And, any Don, others? And then we'll Don, get to the, read, what you could do. Mm -hmm. Don, I can read a, a few of these as well. And then certainly okay. if anyone wants to unmute themselves. Um, so we have um, learning about and from those outside our country, classrooms without walls, making connections between our experience and the larger world, taking a look at the globe as a whole and uh, being on all parts of our learning and how we will learn about each other, our similarities and differences, how we work together and we still are diverse. Um, mm -hmm. Understanding others experiences and having more connection, empathy and understanding, learning Absolutely. about the intersection between our culture and the cultures of other countries, also understanding how local problems often exist globally and vice versa. Global learner can't solve issues with bigger picture in mind. Uh, part of global learning is understanding the interconnectedness of systems in place, uh, understanding that there is not one way or correct way of learning. Uh, and it, it's going on, if you'd like me to continue, uh, giving you some okay. examples here. Uh, okay, problem cool. solving is really important, learning about how our countries uh, solve issues housing insecurity, et cetera, how can uh, help us to solve problems domestically. Um, and then uh, Kimberly writes, yes, sushi is very different in Brazil from the sushi in the US. Food is such a great way to learn about culture. And then we have decentralizing my learning from the dominant uh, attractors, nation, ideology, dominant culture, self, et cetera, away from my comfort zones, zones and habits of mind. Um, and then, uh, yes, show contributions to math field uh, by other cultures, countries. There is a rich history of these contributions. And that was Kimberly responding to uh, the TED Talk uh, that you had mentioned. And Keelan has put the uh, link in the chat for everyone. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Patty. This is all great. And so I think this gives us a good foundation and we're all on the same street. I'm bad with non basketball or tennis illustration. So forgive me if <laughs> they fall flat, but we're all on the same road or the same, the cul-de-sac is what we, we say in Indiana. Um, so I, I wanna just give a little bit of framing and then look at how some institutions have approached global learning so that you can think specifically about what you can do in your own classes and give you some some tools and time to 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 think of some new ways to work on it. So again, it's, it, it, you know, we like to call it the global learning imperative and that it's the framing that helps us solve the challenges of our day. And again, as I said earlier, they transcend borders and boundaries. And you know, we can't say, oh, it's only impacting us when it's impacting people all over the world. And again, a single nation doesn't have the power to solve it. So this was also touched on in some of the comments in the chat is that it's bigger than our own context, but we're a part of it too. So we're not, we are a part of the globe. So when we talk about global learning, it includes us when we think about it. So we could think about it uh, from our local, from our regional, from different states, from different, uh, different uh, provinces, different countries. But the key is that it is our connectedness to the globe that tends to guide some of this work. And one of the big keys is having shared understanding. And Patty knows I love the musical Hamilton and I have seen it far too many times. Um, I was very fortunate to see it early on and to see it frequently because of our proximity uh, to, to New York, it, it, it's easy to get there. Um, and one of the things that there's a song that says that would be enough. Um, and it would almost be enough if we had a vision, a mission and a shared definition of global learning. And so I just pulled some information from different institutions. And this is one of the first things you can sometimes go to when you're thinking about, oh, I'd like to add this global dimension, but is there institutional support if you have questions? And I think if you look at some of these institutions that we have represented here, so College of the Canyons, when you look at the mission statement, and I've put in italics, the workforce development skills, which we know are a part of global learning, um, embracing diversity, fostering technical competencies that support the development of global responsibility, engages students and the community, so that's civic and global, which go hand in hand. I think if you look at Cerritos College and the mission, again, the diverse student population, developing culturally competent students 
with knowledge, skills, and values that prepare them to be productive members of their local and global communities. And also San Joaquin Delta Community College District. Again, the needs of our diverse students and community. And so when you have the support, it appears, if it's in your mission statement, the institution should be on board, then that should also embolden you. And you can say, okay, if your students are saying, why are you having me do this? This is what we believe as an institution. So you can help them recognize and understand that it's something deeper and bigger than just something that you're doing in a single class. This, this rises to the level of importance for the leaders of our institution. Um, same things when you when you look at some of the vision statements. Again, Cal State Dominguez Hills, uh, diversity in all its forms, benefits the world, transcend educational boundaries as we reach out to students locally and globally. So again, seeing that it's not just what happens in our individual place. Also, College of the Red. Oh, sorry. I always, when I try to check the chat, <laughs> I cause confusion. Um, College of the Redwoods, again, looking at participatory citizenship grounded in critical thinking and an engaged student body. And so I think those are other dimensions that are really, really helpful. Um, so the next thing I wanna look at is, again, just affirming before we get into what you will be doing as individuals, just affirming that you have this shared commitment in your vision and mission, you have a definition, and that's what we're going to look at next in an understanding across the institution. So it's it's great if you have this, but it's even better if you've got this large institutional backing. So I want to share a few definitions of global learning. And again, these are on the document that, that, that you will receive. So um, you'll have all this information. And the first one is from AACNU, and I shared this with the group last time. Um, and again, this definition says that global learning is a critical analysis of and engagement with complex interdependent global systems and legacies and their implications for people's lives and the earth's sustainability. So this is a broad definition that can be applied to any discipline, any course, any curricular or co-curricular experience. Another definition from our colleagues at Florida International, global learning is the process of diverse people collaboratively analyzing and addressing complex problems that transcend boundaries and borders, sorry. Another definition I'd like to share is from Kennesaw State University in Georgia. Global learning for engaged citizenship is defined as an educational process that enhances one's competencies for participating productively and responsibly in the diverse international, intercultural, and interdependent world. Global learning opportunities exist in the academic curriculum and in the co-curricular experiences that can be approved both at home and abroad. And then finally, the definition that I often like to share with folks is from our, our colleagues at the Global Service Learning Organization. And that is that community-based global learning is a community-driven and or service experience that employs structured, critically reflective practices to better understand global citizenships, positionality, power, structure, and social responsibility in a global context. And so these are just a few definitions of global learning. And I think it's helpful to kind of look at these broader definitions as you're thinking about how you're framing global learning in your class or in your school, in your department, in your district. So of these definitions, do any of them in particular resonate with you? Do any stand out to you? Um, are there any dimensions or words that you hear that really speak to you in terms of what you think about global learning? So I'm gonna move this back for a minute just so that you can see it. Um, but are there any def any any comments or questions about the definitions and your framing of global learning? I don't know if you want to take a look and then feel free to come off mute or to go in the chat and share anything that's that stands out to you. Hi, this is Kendrick. I like the okay, first yeah. definition. Okay. Where it says global learning is a critical analysis of and an engagement with complex interdependent global systems and legacies. Mm -hmm. And they mentioned natural, physical, social, and cultural. I really okay. like that definition because the cultural and economic and political does shape the country and does mm -hmm. shape its people. Uh, for example, Taiwanese and Chinese folks, they're very different groups. And if you call a Taiwanese person Chinese, even to this day, that's a very drastic, big mistake. Um, for example, in my real estate business, I accidentally called, I thought a Taiwanese person was Chinese and I lost the business. And mm -hmm. to this day, we still civil to each other, but we'll never do business in terms of real estate transactions or whatnot, because 
that that is still there that that history and political climate between Chinese and and Taiwan and mm -hmm. what happened during the Cultural Revolution of 1949. So if I knew my history and I understood that, we probably would have been able to do business. But because of that, it's not a grade that suffered; it's the business that suffered. So I think this is a very important definition from the. Um, American Association of Colleges and Universities. That's that's okay. my opinion, and that, that would be my take for a business okay. standpoint as well. Thank okay, you. thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. I think that's very helpful. Um, and it looks like also we've got collaborative stands out from, from Kim. Um, so again, it's not something that you do in isolation. It's something that you do with others. Um, someone else has said something about engagement. Okay, good. So it's something else where we're actually able to engage with each other. And I'll just put these two definitions back up for you to see for a little bit. Okay, good. Well, some, uh, fostering an awareness of the complexity, yes, of the problems issue is key. There may not be a user-friendly, very good. The example Kendrick gave, you know, that, that is complex. Um, and, and, the, and, and the aftermath is also complex. Um, so it, this is messy, as some people like to say. It isn't something that it's like, okay, we're going to memorize the, the rivers in Asia and that's global learning. Or we're going to memorize, you know, we're going to see, okay, I can name all the mountains, the highest mountains, you know, in the Middle East. It, it's something that is more complicated and more complex. And excellent. Thank you, Kim, Kimberly, with the, yes, it has to be interdependent. That has to be one of the words we use because of where we are, which is so, so true. Now, um, I just want to share a few global learning principles, and then give you some time to go in breakouts and kind of talk about these and come up again with some complex, some concentrated items that you might be able to implement. And then I'll share some things that we have found with, with our colleagues around the country and the world. Um, so when we developed the global learning rubric, and I'll talk a little bit about the rubric a, a little bit later, um, we also developed with, uh, with academics, practitioners, administrators, a wide range of folks from institutions all over the US, we developed some principles that went alongside the dimensions of global learning. One of the principles was that if you are offering global learning, students should have meaningful opportunities to analyze and explore complex global challenges. So that's something that should, we should consider as we're developing global learning activities. Another is students should have an opportunity to apply their learning to take responsible action in contemporary global context and evaluate the goals, methods, and consequences of that action. A third is that the global, the global learning activities should be guided by students should have an opportunity to enhance their sense of identity, community, ethics, and perspective taking. And we've heard a little bit about the ethics and some of the comments that you all have been making. Another point that you all brought up that students should have an opportunity to collaborate respectfully with diverse others. Um, you know, and, and, and that's a real skill. You know, some people say, oh, I collaborate very well. I work with the group and we get things done. But when you say, was it done respectfully? Would everyone who was in that group agree with you? <laughs> you know, you may have a different conversation. And then the final principle we wanna look at is that it, it, it's, it's situating the world in this, this collection of interdependent yet inequitable systems and looking at the role that higher education plays. And, and the folks that put this together argue that higher education has a vital role in expanding knowledge of power and stratification, sustainability and development, and to help foster students, in the, students' ability to advance equity and justice at home and abroad. And I think many of us have had conversations with students who've had an opportunity to travel abroad and they have a lot to say about inequities and justice outside the US and they may have less to say about what is happening in the US context, but we need to prepare them to look at both and to be able to look at these things systematically. So I think now I wanna give you a little bit of time. So we'll take maybe 10 minutes in the breakouts. And I want you to think about examples of activities, assignments, or ways to engage students where these principles are, are operating in your work. So you can talk about your courses, it could be a, a, a civic experience, but how would you provide students with opportunities to meaningfully analyze and explore global challenge? How are students in your program or course able to apply their learning and take action? Um, how are they enhancing identity, community ethics? How are they able to respectfully collaborate? How do we teach them to do that? And that's something that's absolutely critical in our society right now. Um, some of us may live in communities that are quite torn after our presidential election. 
And we have to learn how to collaborate with people that have different ideas, where people that are coming from different political perspectives and people that are coming from different cultural backgrounds. So I will copy and paste this and put these in the chat. And then I'll, and, and we'll break up and we'll take 10 minutes. And then if you can come up with, you can focus on one, two, however the group decides, or you could each say, well, for me in, in my area, I'm gonna focus on this one. So we'll just take 10 minutes and we will go to the breakouts and I'll go ahead and put this in the chat so that you can see what those topics are. Any, any questions before we break out? Okay, well, welcome back. <laughs> I, I realized I think it was only my group that got to see the list of topics um, <laughs> when I tried to go back to share the global learning principles, but I think um, I put them in the chat now so you can see those as well. And I'll share some examples, but would any of the groups, we, in, in, would any of the groups like to share uh, what they discussed or any examples? True, never enough time. <laughs> Um, any examples of any of the dimensions and maybe how you can apply them in your own courses or in your own programs? Could I share? Uh, sure. We didn't really get to do that, but we're focusing on that connection with the student that so they could open up. Um, yes. Yeah, so we focus mostly on that, like problems and connecting with them. Uh, but um, I don't know if, if this would work, but I've been wanting to bring in guests like from, you know, different uh, areas, different cultures, different, uh, if it's, I'm in the English department, but from different fields and just have them speak to my students. Um, I think that'll open up to, you know, the whole world if you bring in, depending on the topics you bring in. Uh, but we didn't get to share stuff like that. We just shared how to, you know, connect with the students and building the trust with them. So only then, you know, they'll open up, you know. Okay. Yeah. But. Thank, thank you, Martha. That's a little bit similar. And I don't know if uh, Sophia, Catherine, or any of the others, um, Melissa, and my group what to say, but I'll just touch on it. We also, you know, we, we talked about caring for students and connecting with students. And we uh, sort of linked that to, um, collaborating respectfully with other groups and how you, if, if we are able to model that, um, then that goes a long way with our students and seeing how to engage and seeing how to make those connections. So we were kind of on the same, and it looks like, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced the names, my apologies. Keelan, um, it looks like you said the same thing, talking about collaborating respectfully with diverse others. Yes, Anyone I think else? that uh, okay. Martha yeah. and Pia and I were all, uh, we were we were talking about that without knowing we were talking about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how we were. <laughs> any, any other groups want to share anything that you discussed? John, I can, I can talk about our group. We, um, we had a, a really interesting conversation um, talking first about uh, Kendrick was was mentioning in his line of work again, taking this concept of being globally aware and of knowing different cultures specific, specifically when you're talking about this with regard to business and business decisions, mm -hmm. um, and how important that is um, not only to show that respect but also to to show that you you have that kind of common knowledge. Um, right. I actually talked about it from the point as a sociologist how stratification is so important. So when you're looking at issues of, of power and dominance and, and you know age, ethnicity, all those kinds of things that stratify us, how when you compare cultures, they may be very different and how we have to understand that oftentimes one culture can be think of itself as more dominant than another. And then what was really fascinating was Ebony went into um, a discussion of, of the work that she's doing uh, at her campus in creating modules that are really looking at aspects of um, of not just diversity, but more in this global context of hopefully helping people who are being trained in different areas to be aware of these kinds of differences. And, and the example Ooh. that came up was, um, say, in a medical profession, for example, especially in COVID, where you're bringing individuals into the, the, the emergency room coming from all walks of life, all mm -hmm. backgrounds. And if you don't have some sort of understanding, um, not 
knowing how to treat them properly or showing them the respect or understanding certain kinds of cultural differences. Um, and we kind of concluded by saying what we have to really start thinking in terms of is the we, not only the me. And, yes. and that, I think, really kind of put it into the context. Excellent. That makes perfect sense. I like that. The we, not the me. All right, excellent. Anyone else want to share anything before we go back and look at some other concepts? Okay. All right. So a couple of other examples I'll, I'll share with you um, as well. These were all good, what you talked about. Um, with some other institutions when they have undergirded sort of what the principles are and what the work. So some have talked about meaningful analysis and exploration of global challenges, looking at education and healthcare issues that impact global and local communities. Of course, that's very easy to do right now in COVID. <laughs> um, the question is, are people ready and willing to talk about that when they may be losing loved ones or having loved ones who are battling? They may be working on the front lines. Um, but it's a, a, a very real issue that, that some have been engaged with in some cases. Um, applying and learning and taking responsible action. We had a good conversation. I think it was Melissa, no, Martha. I believe it was Martha, sorry, who talked about making sure it's at the right level. And you might be at the point where you're ready for your students to start to learn, but they may not be ready to take action yet. So making sure that you find action that's at their level. Um, but it could be advocacy, it could just be awareness, it could be an actual project where people, students are actually out doing these things. Another one, enhancing your sense of identity, your community, your ethics, perspective taking. Again, helping them learn about different members of the community through their projects, understanding the community and their role in the community. Again, I think we've talked a lot about respectful collaboration. It's funny that many of us <laughs> talked about that in our, our small groups. And then the final knowledge of power and stratification at home and abroad is helping people unpack different, different individuals at different sites and different locations and how that, uh, to see if there's equitable access, to see if there's equitable participation. So those are a couple of the examples that, that I've, institutions that I've worked with have looked at and talked about. So the next uh, sort of conversation point is around global learning from our value rubric. And I have put the, the, cont the, the dimensions in the chat so that you can see what these dimensions are. Um, and so you should see there are six that have been included. Um, and so we'll go over those and think about those a little differently. So this is the, what the rubric actually looks like. And this is a rubric for assessment, but many have been using this rubric to recreate and redesign dimensions of their courses. When they say, I wanna do global learning, but I'm not sure how to do that. And so this helps people figure out how they can integrate different global perspectives. But I wanted just to make sure that I show you what the rubric is, so you know where all this came from. And so when you look at the rubric, there's a definition and that's the definition that we talked about earlier of global learning. There's framing language. So anybody who uses it understands what's going on. There's a glossary that goes with the dimensions. And then this is the side where the scoring takes place. So there are different performance levels that are expected based on the, the, the faculty or staff member who are doing the, the evaluation of students. And then you see the dimensions and where we're gonna land is on these dimensions. So as you see in the chat, there are the descriptions of each of these dimensions. And I wanna think a little bit about how these dimensions, again, can connect to what you're doing in your classes and can connect to your courses and the experiences that your students have. And so one is global self-awareness. And this is a systemic understanding of the interrelationships um, you know, among the self, the local, the global, and the natural and physical world. So this is a broader uh, conception of global learning. And so this is where students sort of get that systemic understanding and they're able to place themselves in the world. So those of you that were talking a bit about problem solving, this guides their thinking typically externally when they're talking about problem solving. The second is perspective taking. And this is where students are able to truly engage and learn from diverse perspectives and diverse experiences. And so we really ask students in the perspective taking phase to think about how their own experiences can limit their knowledge 
how their own experiences can enhance their knowledge. And so it really is introspective, but it's also about understanding the perspectives that others have. And so the idea with perspective taking is that you would understand how your place in the world does, do, does inform that, but you're also able to understand how different people think and how different people respond. So perspective taking is one I think that we see a lot of people entering when it's problem solving, but also thinking as we're addressing issues, does everyone think like me? Is everyone from California? Is everyone from my particular community? How might, thing, how might other people approach this topic or this issue? The next dimension is cultural diversity, and you'll see this in the chat as well. And this dimension, dimension again, helps you think about your own cultural origins in, in terms of what you know. It goes back to kind of what we talked about again, helping students develop and unpack that curiosity to learn respectfully about cultural diversity. And, you know, we had one good conversation, another good conversation in our group where someone said, how can you, you know, students may not want to learn things that are global. <laughs> so how do you help students want to do this work? And, you know, one of the things we talked about is the passion that you have in delivering it, but also being transparent with students so they understand why we're doing this work. Um, so again, when you're looking at the cultural diversity, it's helping students to see things from different perspectives and understanding what's happening. So I'll, I'll give you one quick example. This is, uh, so I, I've done quite a bit of work with colleagues in Ghana and I'll never forget some of my students, one of the times we were in Ghana, we were in Accra in the capital and the students made the false assumption that just because everyone appeared to have brown or, or brown skin, that they were all identical. And so one said, well, everybody at this school is exactly the same. There's no diversity here. And so I challenged them. I said, okay, during breaks, I want you to actually listen, see what's going on. Are you hearing different? And you know, what do you, I didn't, I didn't give it all away. Later they came back and said, oh, you know, people are speaking different languages. Now, mind you, we prepared them <laughs> for this, <laughs> but they said, oh, some people are speaking God. Some people are speaking, oh, they're speaking different languages. And they started to understand the linguistic diversity that was right in front of them. Then they started to understand the cultural differences <laughs> among the people who were in our particular community in Accra. And so it helped for them to see that you can't always see diversity as an outsider. You may not be aware of that. Um, and so when you think about this dimension of the, of the rubric, it helps you think about, okay, how can I make sure that this is something that I help my students see? The next one, and this is not surprising to any of us, um, is personal and social responsibility and helping students recognize their responsibilities at the local, the national and global levels, helping them unpack and understand the ethics of the power relationships within a community, um, you know, among countries, among organizations. And so this really helps us when we're trying to help students rethink this organization that is doing work in community who is actually doing the work? Who is actually guiding the projects that are here? What is your role? Are you adding to it or are you maybe causing um, a little bit of tension? Are you having them do more work because you're here and helping them rethink some of those factors? The next one, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way, is global systems. And again, this is understanding how systems are influenced, constructed or operate with differential consequences the human and natural world and how things can be altered. Um, uh, and then finally, of course, this goes back to our integrative learning principle, the knowledge application. How are students applying knowledge and skills to solve these real world and real life problems? So based on these dimensions of the, the global learning rubric that you can see in the chat, are there any that that rise to a level of importance in your courses? As you're thinking about developing global learning programs, as you're thinking about inviting speakers, as you're thinking about enhancing the project-based learning you're doing in communities that are diverse, are any of those dimensions, do, do any of them speak to you more than others? For me, Don, I think it's the uh -huh. social responsibility. Okay. Um, I feel very strongly that as individuals that we need to take on that kind of responsibility personally, um, that I think too often 
we look at issues and problems and we say, well, it doesn't affect me. Uh, and it's easy to sort of pass the buck. But I think if we can at least take a, a closer look at ourselves and understand that we all have a responsibility to the larger mm -hmm. world, um, I, th I think that's, that's key. Okay, excellent. Okay, any others? I think um, the knowledge application, I think is something that I'm really thinking about a lot with my students. Um, they, they really need some support in making those connections and that can be something that's extremely powerful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any others? Okay, thank you, Melissa. So knowledge application and understanding the global systems. Okay, good. And, and what, oh, sorry. Okay, thank you, Pia. Learning the fact that we are all in this together and it is our responsibility to create a connection. Sharing the diversity is so important and explaining the value and importance of it. Thank you for that, that's so true. Kimberly, okay, thank you, perspective taking and understanding why and how we're taking these perspectives. And I think one of, thank you for all of these. I think that this is something that we also see is when you're thinking about developing assignments and activities, you can say, okay, for this particular assignment or for this particular unit or, or however you're dividing your course, what's going to be most important to me and what I'm gonna integrate is going to be perspective taking and social responsibility. And then you say to yourself, okay, how would I do that? How do I decide? Okay, perspective taking. Maybe for this course, that means I'm going to ensure that students have to read articles by people from two different parts of the world. Could be people reading from two people from the same country, but different perspectives. Again, so we're not perpetuating some of the ideas of, um, you know, that as the, the, the ideas of the single story. So if you're having students and you say, oh, we really want to learn what it's like in, in Thailand and what, what, what do the Thai people think, you're having them get diverse perspectives from that country. Also, I think when you're talking about um, having that understanding, um, even within your own community, your own culture, I think that's also a helpful tool too. So I think that's one thing that we've seen. Um, similar issues with cultural diversity as well. Um, let me see, read this comment. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, the, the comment went away, but let me see if I can find, find it. Okay, um, okay, global problems, excellent. Yes, looking at the global differences and addressing the spread of COVID-19, that's a perfect example of that. Why and how are people doing things differently? What are the factors at play? Um, you know, when I'm doing something comparative, you know, we hear this, you know, quite often, maybe it's just the network that I'm in, we hear about, well, they do this for healthcare, why don't we do it? And sort of unpacking it and saying, okay, let's look at what the, what the, the country looks like. What is their economic status? How many people do they have? Um, what is the system of delivery? And so that students have an opportunity to break all of those things down as you're, you, as you're incorporating these diverse perspectives and then have students when they're ready, go to that next level and say, Based on what I learned about Sweden, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, and Brazil, I think this is the model that would work well <laughs> in our context. So they're able to draw and get specific examples from all of those. Um, okay, we've got some additional comments. Okay, good. Okay, going back to opposite sides could also be easily displayed by having young and old perspectives excellent in the same culture and country. Um, I think it's been interesting. I, I have a nephew who is a, a sophomore at Ohio State, and he has been very close. He's very politically aware and active, and he's been really watching and unpacking this. I wouldn't say it's an internal battle within the Democratic Party, but he's found it very interesting that after the election, some of the more moderate Democrats are blaming the progressives. Some of the progressives are blaming the moderates. And so, you know, in some of the analysis that he's doing as a young, <laughs> young, you know, uh, scholar is looking at the ages and looking at the leadership. So I, I think you hit on an important point. Like, does this have to do with age? Does it have to do with perspective, that kind of thing? Um, excellent. Okay, thank you. Kim has another great example of a, of a way to look at different perspectives, a great NPR piece on how a Los Angeles team was sent to Italy to study how they're addressing their homelessness problem. That sounds very, very interesting. Um, they seem to be doing well with wraparound services. Excellent, which what measures H&H 
were designed to do in California. Excellent. There's also a great example on um, This American Life about integrating a police department in the Netherlands. Um, and it was integrating it uh, with different cultural groups instead of just people that were born in the Netherlands. And some other groups in, in the US were looking to say, okay, if we're trying to integrate some industry, if some, you know, some professions that have long been, uh, you know, less integrated, can we look at that model and look at that example? Okay, this is good. Okay, waste management and housing is still excellent. Looking at all these factors, I, I think it was it was particularly interesting when we first started to learn about the water crisis in Flint, which seems like 50 years ago now, <laughs> um, because time, you know, but it's still relevant. And, you know, we worked with a couple of campuses that that was their way to make the global connection because water had always been an issue on their campus that people looked at, oh, we want to build, you know, we're trying to get clean water to communities in other parts of the world. And they said, wait a minute, we don't have clean water in all the communities here. And so it sort of shifted that conversation to why and how water is an issue um, and how to, to expand. So I think these are all ways that you can, when you're looking particularly at the perspective taking and looking at the diversity piece, I think those are others that are helpful. Um, I think one last thing that I think is really important is this dimension of the global systems. And I think that was sort of alluded to a little bit earlier in terms of how we're looking at these natural systems and, and the, the impact of what is happening to the systems over time and how what the impact and the influence are and how different countries and cultures are related to those too. So I think those are some things that are particularly interesting. Um, now, I wanna show you a few examples from our civic engagement. Well, let me ask you, okay, can everyone, does everybody have, can you all do a thumbs up or a clap so I can see that you're still with us? And then I want to get to get your perspective. Would it be, okay, thank you. Would it be helpful? Do you want to see an example of mapping the dimensions to a course? Would you like to see how people have done that? Would that be helpful? Okay. All right, let me, okay, let's show you, okay. Okay. So I'm gonna show you how some have used the global learning rubric for that mapping. Now, let me make sure. Okay, all right. So we'll come back to the civic connections, um, but I wanna show you some mapping. So this is the way that some people have used these global learning dimensions in their programs, in their courses, and other examples. So this was um, an example. So I have a, a colleague, we've been working on initiatives with global health with a number of institutions. And they looked specifically at their global health program and they sat down. So this one would be a program level. And so what they did is they said, we think all of these dimensions of global learning are important. And each faculty member can decide how they are going to teach that particular global learning dimension in their course using the guidance on the rubric, but let's figure out what levels and where they should be in each course. So they said, okay, for our intro to global health course, we're gonna introduce almost all of these. Um, this goes back to Martha's point. The students weren't ready for a formal knowledge application at that level. They wanted to save that for their seminar. They wanted to save that for field work. And so they made these decisions. So they looked at three levels, introduced, reinforce and mastery. Now you can decide what levels you want to do with your, with your course. If you want to have a fourth level, you can decide. If you want to do this at a programmatic level, you can decide as well, but this is just something that folks have done. Um, again, so a secondary course, topics in global health, they said reinforce these two and introduce that. So you can decide sort of within your program when and where and what level students would have each dimension of the rubric. Now, some may say for ours, we are only focusing on personal and social responsibility, cultural diversity and global self-awareness, and that's okay. As the, the faculty member, as the professor, it is your choice what you want to do, but this is just one way that institutions have done it. I've also seen people do this at the institutional level and decide sort of within this department, we're going to do it this way. Now I'm gonna go forward slightly. So this is another example from Allegheny, what was decided for the majors and the minors. And so they decided, okay, these are the levels. We're not gonna expect everyone to get to, a high, to the highest level, 
we're going to expect different levels in the courses. So this is yet another way that you could use the rubrics to do that. Okay. The last one, and this is the one where I want you to think about the course that you're here and the course that you may have been thinking about over the course of your time working with this particular group, is you could do this at your course level and you could do it by assignments. So you could say, okay, the first major assignment, I want to introduce these four dimensions. The second assignment, I wanna focus on global systems. When we're getting out into the community and doing a service site observation, I wanna reinforce what was introduced in the classroom. So this is an example, um, I, I worked with some first year learning uh, seminar faculty and they were looking at, they were working with a, a community uh, organization that was focused on Catholic relief services. So they had folks coming from different parts of the world that were engaged in the work. And so before the students went out to even observe in the community, of course, the faculty members said, we wanna make sure that they have some awareness of what the, the, the dynamics are culturally, as was said earlier, you can't just go into a community without knowing anything. They also wanted to make sure they understood this, the local community, um, the perception in the local community of newly arrived immigrants, what was happening and other factors. And so they wanted to introduce all of that early. And then by the time they got to the service site, they were able to reinforce some of those factors. They had students doing written work where they were integrating elements from those. Um, put your, could you give a, a heads up or a, a high five if you're familiar with signature work? I think we talked about signature work last time. Um, and so that would be sort of a culminating assignment at the near the end of an educational experience. So you can see that if you're looking at signature work, that would, you would have them get to the mastery level in many cases. Um, again, the, you know, some folks said for a weekly response, if you have students that are doing maybe a, a weekly written activity, responding to readings, responding to activities, you would be reinforcing other principles that were at play. And then we can also talk about later if there are questions about critical reflection. So that's another piece. Okay, I think, okay. So I think, are there any, any questions, concerns um, about those dimensions of global learning and how you might apply them in your courses? Any questions there? Okay, all right. So I think we'll, we'll look at high impact practices and then we'll do one other breakout and then we'll get to the sustainable development goals um, and give you some examples there. Does that, that work? Okay, all right, thank you. Okay. Okay. So many of you are familiar with high impact practices. Um, and so we've got this list of high impact practices, and these are practices that have been shown to increase student success for a variety of students, but particularly for new majority students, for first generation students, students of color, students who come from lower resource backgrounds, um, you know, students who have returned uh, to, to colleges and universities after service in the military and other factors. So what we're obviously looking at are diversity in global learning and service learning and community-based learning. But the thing is that these practices are not magical. Um, some people have this belief that just because they're on this list of practices that if you just do it, then that's all that matters, voila, as they say. But that's not the case. And the power isn't vibranium either. I don't know if you all are fans of Black Panther, but I learned about vibranium now and I understand that that's really, but I don't think that that's the power. <laughs> so I wanna give you what the vibranium is for high impact practices. And so George Poo um, and Ken O'Donnell worked on, uh, did, did some research on this topic, and they were able to identify factors that contribute to making the high impact practice high impact and having and students having more success. So this is what, when we're saying we're offering global learning opportunities, we're offering civic engagement, you must implement some of these elements to give them the power so that it's not just about doing it. So I wanna give you some examples of the practices. Um, I'll, I'll go over the practices and then I'll give you some examples. So one, we talked about this earlier, is that performances for students must be set at appropriately high levels. So you're not going to have a first year student at the end of the first quarter, um, go to a community, provide an assessment and give them a, a, a completely new way of running their organization. <laughs> that would not be appropriate on many, many, many levels. 
So what you have to do is look again at what you are expecting a student to do at that level and setting those expectations clearly with the student. Um, you know, and so that's one piece. Another, that students have interactions with educators and peers about substantive matters so that you're setting up opportunities for students to have conversations about topics of substance. Third, there's a significant investment of time and effort by students over an extended period of time. That could be a semester, that could be a quarter. Um, you can determine what that extended period of time is. That students have frequent, constructive, and timely feedback. Um, you know, I, I, we have all been guilty of not getting things back to students as quickly as we may like, but what we have found and what Ku and what uh, Ken O'Donnell and the others have found is that obviously this is intuitive. If you're able to give them feedback sooner, they're able to then internalize that feedback and then it will be applicable to their next assignment, the next assignment, the next assignment. Sometimes when we give the feedback so late, it's too late. They've already written the next paper. They've already done the next project. Next is that students have periodic structured opportunities to reflect and integrate their learning. And so this means that there are real opportunities to reflect. Usually this involves guided reflection and I'll give you a couple of examples for how. Another one, experience with diversity, unfamiliar people and circumstances, we'll break that down. Next, opportunities to discover the relevance of learning through real world applications. We've been talking about that, that that's a hallmark of integrative learning. And then finally, a public demonstration of competence. Now you as the educator would determine what that is. Does it mean a primetime speech on public access television? Does it mean speaking to the dean of the, 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 the college? Does it mean speaking to the president of your, your institution? You can determine what that is. So I wanna give you a couple of quick examples and then give you time in the breakout to talk about how you can embed this with your global learning to increase practices and opportunities for students. So one, again, Ku and O'Donnell say interactions with faculty and peers, but many people I've been working with have broadened that to educators because we know there are educators who are not faculty. Um, we know there are community partners who are educators. Um, and so we have expanded that where, where you are actually giving students an opportunity to have conversations about topics. So this one, um, if you're talking about education abroad, if that's something you're interested in, where students actually talk about place-based issues. So for example, if your students are working on a project, let's say, I'll use the example of the Navajo Nation, the nation within a nation concept. And, and in the evening, I'm gonna have a conversation with my peers or with a student. And I would say, tonight we're gonna talk about, you know, what, what is going on with COVID relief on the Navajo Nation. So I'm not just gonna talk to students and say, oh yeah, you know, wasn't it great? I love the fry bread. <laughs> but no, we're going to actually talk about these topics of substance. And so also give it, putting time in your class sessions to say, okay, maybe after an experience, we're going to have students do five minute conversations. And you're going to talk about a topic and the faculty member rotates as well. Or even when students are coming to office hours, or if you're meeting with students through Zoom, but where you have an opportunity to talk with them about substantive issues. Again, the significant investment of time and effort by students over an extended time period. This could be before, during, and after a program. Again, if you're looking at an experience outside the US. Um, so for example, if students are going to work, um, going to have an experience in Ghana, let's say, they would have placement with an African center in town where there are Ghanaians before and after the experience. So that it isn't just a one-off. Um, this could be the same thing if you're doing a week of service in a particular community or culture that's different from your own, you have an opportunity to engage with that community, to learn about that community beyond just that single experience. So there's a long-term or longer term impact. And it's not just, I fly in, I fly out, and then we don't talk about it again, but it's actually embedded in what other things are going on. Um, the frequent, timely, and constructive feedback. So I've been working with some folks at a couple of other campuses to develop what we've been calling cross-cultural reports. And so these are reports that students can complete no matter what culture that is a bit different from their own. Their, this could be you know, some, a, a community that's five minutes from campus, a community that's an hour away, a community that's six hours away, but where that they're actually able to document and talk about their experiences. And one of the first things that we thought about was having students do what was called the first 48 hours. And that's where students describe their experiences in the site in the first 48 hours. So they talked about what they saw. What did the community look like? What did they learn? Who was there? What kind of people? Were there young people, old people? Who all was involved? 
And then there was an oral and written, there was an oral conversation that was held with students, but then students also provided that in a written format. And the faculty member gave that oral feedback, but also gave constructive written feedback to students connecting the readings and other materials. This one is one that I imagine you have thought about quite a bit, and that's periodic structured opportunities to reflect and integrate learning. And how do you set up critical reflection in a way that is deeply meaningful to students? And one of the things that, that we have found in, in our work is that it's the key is integrating the learning that is going on in all of the different spaces. So if students are learning from community educators, community partners, they're able to share that information on the same level as readings that they may be doing for your class. They're also able to look at scholars from that community or that culture, and they're able to have those talk to each other when they are doing their assignments. So instead of saying, okay, when I do my formal written work, I talk about the people that have published books, but I don't integrate anything that I learned from my partners in the community. No, they're able to talk about things from those different perspectives. And the key is blending them all together. So students don't see, oh, when we're in the field, when we're at practice, it's one thing. When we're in the classroom, it's something else. It's how you can help students see that this is all part of their academic experience. And I think, I th is, is that helpful to break down those high impact practices? Does that make sense, those quality dimensions, what you can do? Okay. So would it, I think I'll, you want to take about 10 minutes again in small groups and talk about how you might integrate your global learning and your handbag practices. And is it helpful for me to put in the chat that list of the quality dimensions so you're not on, okay. All right, give me just one second. And I'm going to, I'll put that in the chat for you. Okay, now this, I am going to apologize in advance. It's gonna have those spaces like it did before because it's coming off a chart. Um, actually, before we break, break, sorry, there was one comment um, Ariel had, I didn't see that, um, about learning from other cultures on cultures. Okay, yes, it's a good start, but we have to keep in mind people who are willing to immigrate to the US have embraced American, yes, exactly. Um, and I think that's the, the key when you talk about um, diversity of cultures in that there may be significant difference from those who have come and there may be differences within. You know, as I mentioned, part of my family is in uh, Miami and there are vast differences of experience, experiences based on when some of their, their colleagues left Cuba, um, based on what their role was in Cuba. So it's really interesting. We've always had this conversation that, you know, about there is no single, single Cuban identity, if you will, um, and how important that is. Okay, okay, thank you, Ebony. We're glad you were with us. <laughs> um, and so I think now shall we break into to groups again and we'll have some time to talk about how you might implement the high impact practices with, the, um, with your global learning efforts. And then we'll come back and talk about sustainable development goals. All right, so we're back. Um, did anyone want to share anything that their small group discussed? Any observations or? Okay, yes, please. I'll Marco. share. Uh -huh. Kimberly was uh, talking about icebreakers and uh, at the beginning of the class and I do that too. And I was suggesting to them that wouldn't it be great to do them during you know, the semester and but going deeper than you know, find somebody that similar to yours, find somebody that speaks this language, but with different types of topics, just like uh, these types of topics right now. And I and I got excited about that idea because I only do it at the beginning. <laughs> I don't know if any of you with, uh, you know, I, I, I used to do this when I taught and then I have a couple of folks that, I, that I've worked with at other institutions where the first, I mean, again, I'm not sure adjusting for the virtual space, but where they have done that um, bingo, you know, where you just oh. people sign, you know, and it's sort of like, oh, okay, you know, I, you know, I've been to, you know, this community or I've been to that, you know, or, you know, I've had this experience working with others, you know, and so I think that's another strategy. I haven't figured out how to do that on Zoom, um, but, you know, it's another way to get people talking because in, in our group, we were talking a little bit about how 
um, sometimes you're hesitant to talk to people that maybe aren't from your group. Now, your group could be faculty, your group could be math, your group could be, you know, but sometimes when we get in these larger groups, we don't really talk to people that are different. And so these same skills that we need for global learning are skills that we, that are applicable, you know, in our, in our own yeah. work and lives. Yeah. yeah. That's a great example. Yeah. Any others, Patty? So Don, we, we, um, we were actually sort of concentrating and, and looking at the, the 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 issue of the high impact practices and and yeah. how and we're using those, um, and it was a really interesting conversation. And I, and I I have to laugh because I had had put together an assignment over the summer, um, and an, an individual in the group had had wanted to use it, and I actually had never never used in a classroom situation. And so she was saying the, how it's turned out to be more difficult and challenging than she anticipated. And as we were talking, it was interesting because it kind of started going into the whole discussion now of what's happening with remote learning. And so while I was envisioning what I put together really being in a face-to-face, -face, the, the, the challenges of, of being in a remote kind of environment was like, oh my gosh, you know, I can see where some of this would then be a challenge. And so I'm hoping to learn from her when the class is over. Um, but I, I, I think that was a really interesting kind of dynamic. And that came up at one, another person in our group also mentioned, you know, he teaches face to face and he's been forced into this remote kind of environment. And how can you, in some cases, take these in high impact practices that you think are going to work um, and would work in a face to face, but are so much more difficult now in a remote environment. That's so true. Any anyone else have anything you want to share with the group? Okay, well, I want to talk a little bit about the sustainable development goals, but I want to also give time for questions. So do you have any questions, comments, ideas you want to share, any reflections? Um, and then we can talk about the SDGs, but I want to make sure that you have time to raise any questions that you might have about any, anything, maybe something that you were hoping we'd talk about, but we didn't, we can talk about it now. Uh -huh. Yes, Martha. I have a question in, in Canvas. Is there a way to have other students from other countries join our class or no that would be difficult i would i'll defer to the institutions because i know for us at my previous institution we could but i know that wasn't the case for everyone with canvas i think it has to do with your settings but i'll defer to okay others from here i know for us that that the individual if uh, the student has to have an actual COC student address um, that we can't bring in folks from from with other non campus related addresses um, so that that's at least I, what is you know exist on our campus. Yeah, um, I do have a question. Um, the presentation zooms that uh, the administration buys into this global learning uh, project or process or way of learning. Uh, how would you approach it if the institution is resistant to uh, these approaches? Yeah, I think I would look at it two ways. Um, one, I would try to identify who in institutional leadership was supportive um, if, because in some cases it may appear that the whole administration is against it, but you may still have a, a senior international officer, you may have a vice president or vice provost or vice chancellor who is supportive of these initiatives. And I would reach out to those people and talk to them about, you know, what, what, you know, what have they been doing to try to sort of <laughs> move folks along uh, in terms of, of the work. I think the second thing is, is making a clear case. And this is what we have found with a number of institutions where there was some hesitancy because now, I mean, I would say probably 80% of US-based institutions have something related to global or international or interconnected or the world in their mission and vision statements. And I think sometimes it takes 
going to them and saying, okay, this is what you're saying matters. We believe it. And we have a coalition of the willing, if you will, of people that are willing to really engage and do this work. Um, but I think the, the key is figuring out who is responsible for that work and reaching out and trying to work with them to push the work. Another thing that I've seen a number of institutions do is do this if if they're not getting the kind of support they they believe they have they want at the, the 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 institutional level widely is going to a dean or going to a, di a district uh, chairperson and saying okay we think this is important Pia is coming with me Martha's coming with me we think this is really important for students in our division and so we are going to then come to them and say this is why we think this is important these are some of the outcomes that we have found from students that are engaged in this work. And then thirdly is just sharing the data, um, the employer data that we have developed and that NACE has used, that's pushed a lot of institutions into recognizing the importance of the global learning because they can't just say, oh, it's just the study abroad office. Um, and so I think when they see that it's broader than just students leaving the country, but it's actually a powerful skill that makes a difference in terms of how students relate with their peers, but also it prepares them for employers. And when we hear employers say it, I think that also makes a difference. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other sort of general questions or comments? Oh, sorry, Kendrick, your hand is up. Yes, hi, um, I'm just curious, how can we utilize all these wonderful ideas that you're presenting in a deliver it in an online platform like Canvas or, or Zoom. The reason why I ask that is it's, you know, live class doing these pair shares and collaborative work was a was a lot easier. And then trying to trying to get students to use Google documents or Google slides or presentation, they I'm, I'm very surprised that they don't know how to do it. So I kind of go over how to use it. I think that's my assumption that because the students are younger, they would know how to use Google slides, Google apps, or even office teams or whatever, because it, it's something that the students would probably grew up with, you know, mm -hmm. but they don't. And it, it's, it's kind of like, wow. And then uh, they're mostly on their mobile phones anyway. So I have to do additional work in terms of finding mobile canvas guides to send to them. So they'll know, even though our institution provides for them, they still don't know. So, we, you know, it, I kind of take it upon myself to, Here's some links to the mobile canvas guides for your Apple and your Samsung phones. And, and it's just, it's just, um, it's just weird. So I kind of like feel defeated in trying to incorporate a lot of these wonderful ideas, even though I have these plans. And then when I implement them, it just doesn't work out right. So I just, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll try again next time. Mm -hmm. So this will be my, um, you know, in, I only been teaching officially online since fall. So I'm not mm -hmm. an online teaching expert, but I'm trying mm -hmm. here, but it's just, it's, it's kind of frustrating on me. So for my mental health, I'm kind of taking it in slow chunks. Do you have any suggestions or if anybody here has any suggestions, that'd be great. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I, one person, uh, I think, did you want to speak about this, Keelan? Because I saw you had a good comment about making a video. I don't know if you wanted to say something. Oh first. yeah, I was just gonna say that um, my students also like I I can't make any assumptions, and I've been teaching online for a long time, but I can't make any assumptions that even though they might have some familiarity with it, that they still are struggling a little. So uh, one of the things that I actually learned from our um, from our uh, coordinator of our stretch program was to make these quick videos, like really quick videos. And just walk them through it. So do it yourself. It's kind of helpful. And it also, I think, you know, helps to make them feel more comfortable, um, engages them a little bit. So it's a nice, uh, it has dual purposes, I guess. And we also do tons of um, sessions on these different things too, um, in order to so yeah, definitely Pia, you're right, uh, at one and 3CSN also has a lot of sessions on the different tools and we have a lot of videos. So we're happy to help you uh, work on this too. Great, and I'll just add one thing that 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 I'm I'm seeing and hearing the same thing that you said that some of the students are really savvy and some are not. Um, and then also sometimes it comes down to what they're using. Um, you know, are they using a computer? Are they using a, a a phone, a smartphone? What is the device they're able to use? What is their internet access? You know, that's always a challenge sometimes because if 
if there are four people in the home that are using that device or using the Wi-Fi and they're using the phone, maybe it's not as easy for them to go into the breakouts. They can't see people or they can't have their camera on or off. So I think there are some other um, uh, other factors that we've been hearing uh, from people as well. But I think I think you're right. I would say don't give up, <laughs> of Kendrick. And I would say you know if you if you have a, a good network of even maybe one, two, or three other people that are trying as well, um, that's one thing that's been really helpful for me as I've been trying to do different technologies and using these things. Is when I have a couple of folks that I can just go to and say. I just did this workshop and I tried this thing called mural or I tried Menti and it did not go well, <laughs> you know, what would you <laughs> recommend, you know, do you have suggestions. So I think that I think finding sort of just one or two other people that are also as as ambitious, if you want to say it or just adventurous and willing to try new things. Um, and then and then going back to the resources that are offered by your institution. I think that's helpful. I think, um, I think Sophia, there was a question for you about your network, if, am I correct? About the network of ESL folks and someone was saying, what college is that? Yeah, I was just trying to look for the website. It's actually okay. um, an ESL instructor. I believe he's in San Diego, at the San Diego Community College where he has a a link, a video, a website, and I was going to put it in there. Uh, it's actually eslvideo.com. And he has um, a page or something where he, he has virtual exchange. So he works and creates, there is a form that you fill out and he connects you with other uh, colleagues from different parts of the state. I mean, even here or out of state, California, so I mean, across the country, even sometimes another country. So that might be worth getting into it, uh, they, they, they participate. So it's a really good connection if you wanna reach out to other students. So it's kind of like both classes come and join together and you work collaboratively with another instructor from Portland or whatever it is, or another country, sometimes three classes at the same time. So I'm gonna put it in the chat mm -hmm. and the name of the organizer. And he's very, very welcoming of promoting this a lot to, to work more, uh, broader uh, span. So maybe he might have ideas of other uh, colleagues for different areas. Like Martha was saying, she teaches English. Well, English, ESL, that might even, um, just having that interaction with a different student population might make our students more have to engage and participate and not so much, so much technology in a way, you know, it's kind of like if we can join with them and see we are sharing the same struggles. Uh, like I felt for uh, Kendrick, yeah, we as a colleagues, I feel the same thing. I always thought face to face. And now that we're teaching online, um, there are so many wonderful tools. I hear about toolkits and this and that. You use Kahoot, you use it, that I am the one who has to come and now implement all that. And that is the biggest challenge. Uh, I have all these great resources, but I'm, I'm like feeling like sometimes I'm drowning with all this technology that is given to me. So how could I present that to my students in a, in a way that I, I understand it and then they can get it and they can be welcoming of that. And somebody mentioned about time. It's, it's about giving ourselves time and giving them time to absorb this and to understand what's going on like Google. I teach different groups of, I mean, ESL, I teach Spanish, which is English savvy kids with technology. They are even teaching me sometimes what I'm doing. Using Canvas, I'm teaching a student success class, which they just wanna go asynchronously. And, and then I am still holding on to the synchronously because my ESL students, that technology is the biggest factor that sometimes for me as not being an online teacher, now that, yeah, I got the certification and all that, but it's, there are so many tools out there that I don't know which one to do and start with or where to go. And, and I feel like my students are feeling the same. Um, they're being overwhelmed by all this nice technology that we're giving them, Flipgrid and PlayPosit. Uh, I mean, you name it, uh, Pear Deck and all that. So where do I start and which one? So I think I need to give myself time. And that's what I would say for Kendrick, you know, it's kind of like pause, find one and then just go because they are going through the same thing. If we throw so many things of in like Kahoot, uh, you have to have two tools. You, I mean, you cannot just, if you are in the laptop, 
then they have to have their phone. You cannot, what about those students that use their phone? They cannot be part of that. So it's learning that, but it's a lot of with collaboration, finding out, um, I heard this from so many conferences, sharing is caring. And, and I'm taking that with me, sharing is caring. We need to share like that when I heard somebody is sharing these tools, but sharing people you can work with, collaborate with someone. That's, it's all these tools, but someone who can explain to us okay, well, this is what you can do. Even a canvas shell, a lot of OER. OER is wonderful in a sense that somebody already created a canvas shell with what I'm, what I'm class I'm teaching. It will be nice that that instructor will collaborate with me and explain to me what, what she did or he did. And then I can just modify that to my needs to my, or my students' needs. And, and, you know, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. A lot of collaboration and, and yeah. And taking time. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Thank you. Was I in mute? No, no, we heard you. It was good. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, you Thank you. Yeah. I just saw so mute. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. And then I'll just say one last thing. Thank you, Pia, for your comment about letting letting students know that we need help <laughs> and letting them know that we're learning with them. That that came up in our our small group. The first breakout was you know, just showing that humility that we don't know how this works, you know, we need you too. <laughs> and that makes a, a big difference with the students too. Well, Don, I know we've come to the, the end of the, uh, the session here and this has been wonderful. And we just wanna say thank you so much for taking your time today and going over all of these important uh, aspects um, of global learning. Uh, and definitely we will get the handouts out to, to folks. Um, and I just want to say thank you to all of you for being here. Uh, these sessions have been recorded and we know that they have been very, very popular. People are going back and watching them. And so, uh, as I said at the beginning of the hour as well, uh, Kimberly and I are working on uh, putting together, uh, we've got names, we haven't made those contacts yet, but hopefully we will have uh, a great lineup of speakers for spring. So again, we wish you all well. And Don, thank you so much again for being with us today. This was wonderful.